All right, you grasshoppers. Uh, it is Wednesday morning here. Look at that smiling face there. So this young gentleman, uh, Jason Bedolin, uh, when I got in the agent business, so I went out and tried to recruit him, and he was too, he was too smart to go with me as uh, <laughs> with somebody else. But uh, I ended up uh, representing you anyways when I went with IMG, didn't I? Well, not, it was with Mike. I was with uh, JP Barry actually yeah, when, when Mike right. Barnett switched. So yeah, I got switched to JP. But yeah, that's an interesting discussion all yeah. in itself. Yeah, didn't we uh, didn't we meet when you were a kid too? Wasn't some story that we were in a hotel, uh, Ron Gresham's room or something, and uh, you kids were there playing the game, and we ended up sitting together like in the floor of the hotel for. Yeah, yeah. till till the wee. Well, I mean, I don't know how long I stuck around for, but I know my dad was in his glory because he was hanging out with the Rangers that night, and I got to meet you guys in this. Uh, yeah, I don't know what kind of room that was or what was really yeah. going on, but I was definitely less than ten, uh, yeah. probably around eight or nine. So that was a pretty cool experience for sure. That's right, because I think we were with the Rangers, and it was Ron Gresher's family was in Edmonton or something, and we had a little get together after the game. I was sitting around having a couple of adult beverages, and your father brought you in. That's right. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah that's pretty cool. All right, so Jason, um, uh, as everybody knows, uh, was a professional hockey player, played junior hockey out in Sp were you in Spokane the whole time. Spokane, yeah, four years in Spoke. So, so tell me quickly your your stops there in the, on the pro circuit. Oh my goodness, we don't have enough time, I don't think. But uh, <laughs> everybody wanted. No, to it, it was interesting because I played uh, I played my four years in Spokane and uh, and loved it, and then got drafted by Florida, thirty first overall, and. Really, I mean, gr green, you could call me, but I just thought that I was going to play in the NHL for the next 10 years and retire a Florida Panther, and and that was just sort of what I knew. And uh, my first year pro, Florida had just come off that cup run, so they had gone to the the, the, floor, the, the finals against Colorado where they got swept, but they, uh, they rode Beezer and had that great, great run. And then they were kind of in this ground where they – thought they were maybe better than they were kind of you know and they and they wanted to tool up for the playoffs to hopefully have another good playoff run that meant they traded me to Toronto for Kirk Muller at the trade deadline so wow. kind of a uh, interesting timing of, of our of our little discussion here today just after the trade deadline so I actually got traded twice at the trade deadline but the first time was uh was to Toronto so Cliff Fletcher um got me which is an interesting story because if you go back to the draft he had told me he was going to be, I was going to be their first round pick that year in Toronto. And then that never worked out. And that's a whole nother discussion, but he ended up getting kind of his guy, I guess. I, I knew he liked me early and then he ended up trading for me and, and traded Muller for me. And uh, yeah, ended up in Toronto <clears throat> was with that organization for two and a half years. Cliff ended up getting fired that summer. Um, unfortunately for me uh, and, and Neil Smith got brought in and, and that was when, I think it was Neil Smith or yeah, Neil Smith. And then, um, and then, yeah, I was kind of toiling in, in St. John scoring a ton of goals and, uh, and couldn't really get a sniff up with Toronto. And then that was when I got traded again at the deadline. Then I went to LA. Uh, so LA brought me in and I was between long beach and LA, uh, after a season with them, I got put on waivers with them. Tampa Bay picked me up, which put me in Detroit with the Vipers uh, never got called up in Tampa Bay, which was weird because they had like the worst team in the world, and everyone on my team seemed like was getting called up, and it was just whatever one of those one of those stories. And then went to Winnipeg, asked for a trade there, and that's the Win Manitoba Moose at the time. Um, that was just an independent, and then I got signed by the Islanders, and then was with Lowell for a little bit, and uh, told you didn't have enough time for this, <laughs> and then played with the Islanders, and then I decided to go to Europe. So I was three years in Mannheim. Uh, ended my career with. Um, in Japan, had a tryout with Detroit Red Wings at the end, and then, um, and then, yeah, called her a day. Wow, I mean, I, I mean, it's obviously you didn't get the NHL career that you wanted to have, but I mean, it's you got you, a lot of experiences, right? Oh, tons. Yeah, I mean, that's what's the the downside is almost nothing, right? Uh, the upside, the upside is huge. I got to see see tons of the world at a great age. You know, I didn't have a family, I didn't have kids at the time, so I wasn't all those stops and trades and kind of stuff that maybe doesn't get talked enough about by the casual fan, but that's a big deal. Um, you know, getting moved and getting moved in like two hours that your life changes in the legitimate two hours. You're picking up, you're never going to see your apartment again and you're gone on the next flight. And um, I didn't have to do that with a family, which would maybe may even ma made it harder. But uh, yeah, I mean, I got to see a ton of great places, meet a ton of great people. Like, you know, I mean, even this conversation with you right now is because of you know, my connection with hockey. And I mean, that goes on and on and on. Yeah. That's great. Good stuff. So what are you doing now? Now I'm, uh, I'm helping young guys, uh, do, 
do what I, well, I guess do what I did. I, I downplay what I did. And it's kind of funny because I think there's like 6,000 people that have ever played in the NHL or something like that. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's still a, a great big honor to be able to say that I did that. Like you say, it wasn't what I wanted it to be um, starting out. It wasn't what I expected it to be. And that was fine. I mean, that was what it was when I was 30. I was done. I moved on. I was doing other things. And now my kids are playing and now I'm helping them meaning like my own, my own children, right. Are, are playing and, uh, and they're getting pretty serious about it. And it's fun kind of to, to dial them in and to, to make sure they're accountable to what they want to be and who they want to become. And then I was able to kind of deconstruct my own, my own situation again. And like, you know, what, what maybe could I have done different or where did things go wrong or, you know, that sort those sort of questions. And, and, uh, there was a lot of stuff. I mean, I, I could have done really, you know, and, and, and I'm sort of feeling, I'm well, not sort of, I'm feeling that void now. I mean, if I existed for myself back in the day, um, I think it would have been a lot of, uh, it would have benefited me a lot to someone to talk to someone to keep me on the rails, you know, someone to help me through some of that adversity or some of the challenges even that came up when it came to the trade or how to, how to walk into the Toronto Maple Leaf dressing room at 21 years old and you don't know anybody and you just got traded for Kirk Muller and there's, 200 cameras in front of you and you're playing against the Legion of Doom that night and you were just in bed in North Carolina in the minors, you know, like it's a, uh, that's a lot going on. There's a lot to unpackage when you're, when you're a 21 year old kid and it would have been nice to have someone to, to walk me through that. Isn't that true? Like, you know, I do all this true good life. I do the book and podcast and you know, public speaking and everything. And it's funny how, you know, I'm 61 now and it wasn't until like probably two or three years ago that I really started to sit back and think, I think it was really the starting the book that made me really look back at my life and see the, you know, the good things and the bad things and just things that the way I grew up, um, you know, I talk so much about my father and grandfather on the farm, getting up every day and milking the cows and how that kind of, uh, you know, that lifestyle really helped me because that, I, mean, I wasn't that great of a player. It's just, I just showed up every day, you know, but it is funny looking back on it now, uh, the things you learn, training things, you know, the diet, uh, the mental part of life in general, but particularly sports. And if you knew all that stuff back then when you were playing, uh, right. It's you know, what a different, yeah. uh, it would have made, you know, you see these players now and, and then they're still like the same as we are, right? They're going to look back years now and go, geez, I wish I had done that. But I think they are much more in tune with their bodies and the diet and, and everything. But uh, it, it is funny to look back at that stuff and go like, what the heck was I thinking sometimes? Yeah, Why did no, I 100%. Yeah. We, we found we found our niche, I think, for what worked well. But at least for me, you know, I, I, felt, uh, I felt that I had kind of my own physical uh, – performance sort of dialed in and the best we could back then. But then when it came to, you know, when it, when it came to mentorship or asking questions or, you know, something to do with emotion, emotional uh, welfare, or, I mean, those types of things were just not talked about at all. Right. Yeah. And and then you were just sort of left to, to do <clears throat> whatever it is you thought you were supposed to do. And sometimes that's not the best way. And I, I think the kids now these days are even more, um, adverse to the adversity or more susceptible, I should say, to the adversity just because it's been so dialed in, right? For, for the guys growing up now, like everything's been planned out and you're going to be here and you're supposed to be there and, and and you have your strength coach and you have your nutritionist and you have all these things. And when something kind of goes sideways or something comes off the rails, it's, you know, it's the big eyes and you know, now what? This wasn't supposed to happen. So you think it's worse now? Like, do you think more? And I, you're probably right. I think back to myself. Like I was at like a, I, I compare it sometimes to a mutter, like a, a horse that you know runs in the mud better than he does you know, get back, right? So I was more used to things not being perfect for me. I never had any expectation of being perfect. It was just, you know, just keep grinding it out. So you think it's harder on kids now because they more have that kind of perfect life all set out for them. I think so. I think parents are more apt to try and solve problems for the kids growing up right. now. I think that they're stepping in and dealing with the adversity. I think that, I, I think a lot of these things are, yeah, I just don't think adversity is something that parents think is even good anymore. It, you know, for the most part, obviously there's exceptions to the rule. And, and so I think that it's a very sheltered kind of existence. And then when you do get on your own and you're pro and, and you're, there is some things that you have to tackle. And now you're left, you know, being an individual in a scenario where, where it's getting a little bit bumpy. I, I think that there's, there's some guys that, that are having a harder time with it and which is fine. I mean, it's neither here nor there, but that's why guys like me exist or that's why agents are now filling a different role too sometimes, right? Like there's more, there's more assets for people um, to get through some of this stuff. So what do you think? Like, what would you do different? You know, like, would you say uh, in your NHL career that, Really, I like Jason Bedolin was as talented as these guys that played in the NHL, but maybe I it was the mental part of the game that wasn't where it should have been to have a an NHL career. 
Uh, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, if I was to really pick myself apart, of course, there's, there's a, there's a big accountability thing there. Was I doing stuff really different than other guys? You might think back, I mean, I'd have too many beers. Was I going out too much, you know, like that kind of stuff. And I mean, I could say, yeah, I, I should have not have gone out as much, but I mean, I wasn't reading, leading the charge or being, you know, I mean, I never had an issue or whatever. So it wasn't like I can beat myself up over that, but I just think the biggest thing was just finding, I never believed at the NHL level that I was supposed to be there. Why? And that was the biggest thing. And I mean, like you said, you mean Jerome McGinley is a hall of famer and him and I were had comparable stats in junior, right? Like there is, yeah. you know, like there is even in the minors led the league in minors at 21, you know, 42 goals one year and like had, had success. But then when I got to that next level, it was never, I never wasn't, I wasn't maybe sure that I was supposed to be there. Or I never got in, in a scenario where I was able to believe in myself. And I think that belief is a, is a big deal. And, and, you know, and then the thing too, right? Like the communication aspect back then, you know what it was like. I mean, no one told you nothing. You yeah. didn't line up or you were out and, you know, yeah. make it work. And um, I ended up playing safe when I had what what I would deem as my opportunity. I was trying not to make mistakes. And you know what happens when you do that? You just yeah. blend in and you're yeah. neutral and gray and and off you go again. So, yeah, I mean, there are some things I would have, I would have, like the things I know now with the personal development side, with the sports psychology side, like I would have, in the minors, I would have been doing more stuff to to get myself to believe that it, I was in the wrong spot, and not just from a what from doing, a, what, doing actual like training your mind more. Well, doing first of all, doing more stuff either on the ice or away from the rink to build that confidence that I'm a guy that does stuff differently, right? That I'm a guy. I think your true grit life stuff. I mean, an aspect of that I think is very relevant to high performance, very relevant to positioning yourself uh, and your, your your psychological self in a spot that you know what I do things differently than people not just on the ice, not just scoring goals, but I take care of the little things. I take care of the details. Yeah. So I think there would have been a way to, uh, to grow that confidence. And also from a, from a thought process, from, from a, from a visualization standpoint, from a, from a mental conditioning standpoint um, to really live in an NHL Jersey. And you can do that before you get there. Right. Uh, there's definitely ways to do that. And, uh, and I wasn't, I was a guy that segregated myself, right? When I was in the minors, I wasn't watching the box scores. I wasn't no one who was hurt and, and I don't, I don't right or wrong. That was just the way I dealt with where I was at. You know, I just sort of felt, okay, this is where I am. I'm not saying I would have gone back and I would have now dissected every move Toronto was making or whatever, but I would have done a lot more work on my mental side of what, where it is and what it's going to be like when I get there too. Yeah. You know how I'm going to. I agree. Perform. I agree with that a lot. I think you get kind of give yourself a license to be more confident, right? Because you've done more work, whether it's the the physical part of the game or the mental part of the game. And everybody's different. You know, I mean, some guys come into the game almost being arrogant and cocky, believing that yeah. no, absolutely I belong, right? Uh, and that's fine. You, you kind of need that that cockiness to to make it. And other people, maybe like yourself more, or maybe not believing in yourself as much. And if that's the case, then find a new workout. I view it the same way that. You know, if you're not uh, strong enough in your upper body, well, you go in the gym and you work out. So if you're not strong enough in your mind, go and work out at that. And you could you can yeah. accomplish the same thing. So I, I agree 100%. Yeah. No, and it's interesting. And you try and – because hockey was very much a, a fit-in sport. You yeah. Know, like it, more so now you're allowing the individual to stand out a little bit. But it was, you know, it was a melting pot I found for sure. And so like to be – cocky or to come across that way and i think some guys actually perceive me that way but i definitely wasn't you know yeah. like i i just want to be one of the guys it was really like my biggest thing was to be one of the guys and fit in and and find my way within that but yeah there's there's i believe there's a way to to have an inner quiet confidence that uh, maybe doesn't you know it doesn't come out on the outside but you, you know you're in the right spot and you know you're supposed to be there yeah and like you said too it's uh you know that desire to fit in right i mean like hockey guys I, yeah, it's still the same way as they talk the same way, dress the same way, you know, drive the same kind of cars, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, sometimes you're going to have to be that, um, you know, go it alone. Right? I've talked about a lot with True Grit Life that, you know, to, to be successful, to reach the top, the pinnacle or wherever, you know, the, the highest point that you can get for yourself. I mean, sometimes you are going to have to go it alone and it, it, you're not just going to have to, you know, do what everybody else is doing. And even in that team structure, you still want to be that team player. Uh, but you still got to do what is right for Jason Bedolin or Tom Laidlaw, whoever it is. I mean, yeah. I was you know for, so fortunate to play with so many great players, you know, Phil Spazito and Wayne Gretzky and Larry Robinson, those guys, and fantastic team players. But they also knew that, okay, they needed to take care of their business. Their job, in Phil's case and Wayne's case, was to score points. So they needed to do that. They, they, they would step out and do, like Wayne Gretzky was famous for standing on the ice for three or four minutes. Where everybody else is out for... 45 seconds and that wasn't him being a bad teammate he just felt like okay, that's I, i'm i need to help my team i'm on a roll here 
you know, I need to do what's right. Not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna play like Tom Laidlaw plays. I need to play like Wayne Gretzky plays, right? And that's right. that strength that you have to have to, to reach that top level. So. Yeah, and I think, and and the more you read, right, and the more you get into autobiographies and people who are great at, at anything, it's yeah. it's usually that they aren't they aren't doing things the same as everybody else. Um, yeah, you know what I mean, like the. the like all these guys, and that's the guys when I work with Junior now, and even let's say you got a midget AAA guy or a bantam AAA guy, and they're going, and they're going, oh, yeah, you know, like, well, I practice twice a week, and I got my, you know, we got our workouts, and, and I'm like, well, what else are you doing? Right. Well, I don't, I'm like, so you're doing the same thing every other 15-year-old is, you know, and you think that's going to get you to the, the the next level, right? And it's, and maybe it's not doing 15 extra workouts, but, I mean, you got to think different, right? Like, you you got to do a little more, and you got to think that you're a guy that's going to do a little more. And that's well, – not only is it going to help, but it's also going to help you believe that you're going the right spot. I, I, yeah, I agree. You know, I've talked – I, I said it's kind of jokingly, but it's the truth. You know, Wayne Gretzky and I really had just really one thing in common, right? We both had a dream and we both accomplished the dream. The difference was that my dream was to play in the NHL. His dream was to be the best player that ever played in the NHL. Yeah. And we both accomplished those goals. So you know, if I was look back at it, you know, I, I look back and I go, well, I'm happy and I'm proud of myself that I, I accomplished a goal and played in the NHL. But, you know, and I don't beat myself up over it, but if I was to go back and do it again, I would have dreamed of being the best defenseman that ever played. Whether you reach that goal or not, you're going to, you know, you're shooting for something higher, right? So, yeah. So what, um, so you got a company, what's the name of your company? Up My Hockey. Yeah, Up My Hockey. Yeah. So what are your, so we're talking a lot about beliefs. So what are your beliefs when you're going in and teaching these kids? Like, what are you after? Are you trying to improve them mentally, physically, everything? Well, I want them to think different usually, you know, sometimes not every, every, every individual athlete that I'm working with is different. It's coming at me from a different spot, but the idea, the overarching idea is really to have action thoughts and words align with their goals and dreams. And, and that's, I mean, that's really a big statement there when you unpack, well, what's the goal and what's the dream and, and where do these thoughts, words, and actions come into that? And I think when we get on the, when we get those things aligned, those, those five things, you're, you're powerful, much more powerful than otherwise. Right. And, and that's sort of the end. My tagline is just like, you know, let's try and reach your potential. And, yeah. and I think when guys do that, like, what's the worst thing that happens? Yeah. You know, like you're going to get farther than you would have otherwise. And even if it's not in this case, my hockey players becoming NHL stars or NHL players, all these things that they're learning and, and, and living and, and breathing are things that are going to help them in life and just be a better human. So, um, you know, character comes into these things. I mean, the consistency, you know, accountability, like all these great words that there's not really a platform for them anymore in, in a lot of spots um, become, become topics and themes. And it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to talk about. You know, I, I, I give you know, so much credit to youth coaches in any sport, you know, across the board, even if they're paid coaches, because it's a, a thankless job and you're putting hours and hours in. Um, the one thing I think gets lost a little bit sometimes, though, and I don't think this is like some, you know, bad thing about coaches, but it's, I think we would stress a little bit more. And I think you're touching on it. You know, coaching kids in sports isn't just about, you know, to coaching them to be better hockey players or better soccer players, whatever it is. It's teaching them to be better people, too. And I think the two of them go hand in hand. If you want that person, that young man or, or, or girl or boy uh, to be a better hockey player, you're teaching them how to be better people, too. Right? You're teaching them things that, okay, you can't do something right now. Like you can't, like as a backward, as a defenseman, maybe you're not a good enough backward skater right now. But if you go work at that, you can become a better backward skater. And that's the same thing in life where you can, it's kind of teaching them that, okay, don't be afraid to say that you fail at something. Now, it doesn't mean you're always going to fail at it. Go to work and become better at it. And I think that's one of the great things you can get from, from kids yeah. sports. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I actually have a, I have a, you know, a presentation that I do on that with coaches and, and for people. And that's, you know, and I, I think, I think sports, sports is, if people talk about sport, sports providing character or growing character, you know, it, it almost like it's, it's a synonymous type thing. And, and I kind of disagree with that. I think sports teaches character if you want sports to teach character. Yeah, totally. um, and, and, and I think when, when I, with my, I mean, I'm talking when I'm coaching now, like my actual hockey team, um, I do the same thing with my clients, but it's not about winning. It's about it's character is the first thing that I'm talking about all the time and different aspects of it, whether it be, you know, whether it be consistency or whether it being a good teammate or whether it being uh, how you compete, you know, like these aspects of, of what makes us up will then make us a better hockey player. And when we focus on those aspects first and that's the theming and that's what you're talking about and that's the, what you're driving home. It's not, 
It's not about making a tape to tape pass or what the breakout looks like, right? It's like these other things that are going to allow them to be better hockey players, better people, better teammates, um, and thrive more, right? So yeah, I'm I'm 100 like, of course you guys like to win. I mean, I love to win. I've always loved to win. I'm a super competitive guy, but um, when you put the winning first, I think the person gets lost, and that's one thing that we've been talking about a lot is like, uh, and becoming more mainstream. I, mean, I just interviewed Dusty Emu for my own podcast. Uh, he's a uh, NHL developmental goaltending coach. And he was echoing what Travis Green was saying at the NHL coaches conference. And it's what I say in my philosophy and it's about coaching, coaching the person and not the player. Right. Um, and, you the person what, first. And, and you touched on the winning part too. And, <clears throat> and I actually think it's important to coach to win, but it's, it's the process that goes into winning. That's important, right? It's like, right. You're, you want them to have that goal. It, you're not just showing up and you know going through the motions, but to me, it's that it is as, as a coach and as players, building every player to be a better player, a stronger person, so that by the end of the year, when you go to that end of the year tournament, you've got the whole team being better, not just your top six forwards and the other kids sitting on the bench. It's everybody has gotten better because you've gone through the whole process. You've you've gone into games where maybe you're up two to one and you want to go put the top guys on the ice every time, but you give your other guys a chance too that are you know are perceived not to be those top guys. And it's yeah. that pulling together and sometimes you're going to fail. And it's that pulling together as a team to say, okay, here's a lesson for us, guys. You know, that don't don't look at this one guy as the reason why we didn't win that game. This is a team game, and maybe you could have done something differently. All those different things, all the practices where you've, you know, like I said, you and I, I, I guess because I'm a defenseman, I use this example all the time where you couldn't do something at the start of the year, but you worked at it and worked at it by Christmas. Now all of a sudden you can perform that. Uh, backward skating move that you couldn't do before. So now you're a stronger player now because you're a stronger player than the team's stronger. So I just, I, I try to say to people, it's like, yeah, yeah, we want to win, but it's, it's how you win. It's that process that goes into winning. So. Yeah, 100%. And that's, I mean, that echoes what I was saying earlier with like aligning your goals and your, uh, with your actions, thoughts, and words, right? I mean, that's the process. I mean, you teach the process, you teach the process, you teach the process and the results, the results generally come. And that's what, uh, that's what Travis Green said. He said in his speech, he, it was ballsy for him to say that. Like, you know, in front of his peers, second year coach, and and he said at the NHL level, right, that he's like, when I make my biggest mistakes when I put winning first. Huh? And he says when I look back on it, he's like, those are when I made. I, I've sacrificed the trust from players. I've I've lost guys. You know, when when that yeah. becomes the focal point, and he's yeah. like, if I can keep the person first, I I get way better results on the ice. And he goes, I just yeah. got to make. That's where I get my get caught because it is. It's a it's a results business, right? right? At that level, it's a hundred percent result. You have to win. You have to perform. Your job's at stake. Um, but he still found on in that environment, in that climate, that if he can keep the, the person first, that he has better, better success. Yeah. I think that's very true. I right? these times during the like, same thing, you're up by a goal late in the game, and it's so easy to go with just your your same old guys all the time, you know, as reliable guys. But you know, that's the opportunity to put somebody else in those, you know, tougher positions, right? And now you you've thought of that player of making him a better player. You haven't put the win first, although you still want to win. You're concentrating yeah. on making that player or multiple players better players. It's a good point, but it's right. It is pretty yeah. balls to say that. Yeah. NHL. With, that's an interesting question for you, Tom, because I, I mean I've heard it time and time again with with teams that have won. Um, I talked with Brad Larson the other day. He was on that Colorado team that ended up going to the going to the Cup final and had those battles with Detroit and you know like ten Hall of Famers on one team kind of stuff. And he just said like the accountability in that room was huge one. And he said two. he said every single player that had a Jersey on felt like they're the most important guy in the team. Yes. And, uh, and I just thought like, and that was what I, I felt that in Detroit, I got 30 when I came into that room and I never made that team I only played a couple exhibition games, but like that environment there, everyone felt important and cool. wanted and, and integral and everywhere else I was, I felt like, you know, an afterthought and like nobody gave a shit about me. Right. So it was like, it was a very interesting scenario. And I think a good coach will do that. And I think a good team will do that. Like yeah. they'll, they'll make those guys, the fourth line guys, the role guys, whatever that position is, feel like they're doing a job and making a difference. Well, I think that's so crucial. I think that's so missed so many times you watch uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs right now, and they've got a bunch of young kids there. And they'll they'll grow and become better, but right now they don't get that part. They ha I don't think that you can watch them play. They don't pull for each other. They're not pulling the same rope. You know, I've talked about Boston so many times and Zdeno Chera or Patrice Bergeron. And you talk, you listen to uh, Zdeno Chera and he talks about rookies coming into that locker room. And you know the old days there was hazing and you know all that kind of stuff. And he says, nope, that's not going to happen on my team. If you're on my team, it doesn't matter if you're a what, first year player or a, a ten year player. Uh, you're you're part of this team, and you're going to be treated the same way. And I just think to myself, 
you know, imagine you know, so you got Zidane, Zidane Ochera, the great career he's had and the conditioning he does and the aura about him and the size of him. And if you're walking in there as a young kid and the leader of the team says that, yeah, you feel like, wow, that's that's amazing, right? Yeah, I, I'm in the NHL and I'm being accepted by this guy who doesn't have to treat me that way. No, 100%. Um, yeah, did I, you hear what they do there with like as far as the mentorship side of things go? What's that, sorry? Like, did you have you heard what they do there with the mentorship yeah. side of things? I guess like, like, like how you just said Zidano and Patrice and like these core guys on that team, like they will actually get assigned like one of the younger guys. And like, and that's like the mentorship role and they take care of these guys all year essentially. And I just thought that was, I don't know if they're still doing that, but I heard that a couple of years ago. And then what a brilliant play that is because, you know, now you have the guy to talk to. Now you have the guy, you know, that makes you feel like you're, like you're there and you're getting looked after. And um, I thought Detroit did that real well when they were successful too. A guy like Darren Helm would come in there and all these guys would come in and you'd have, You'd have the first line right winger teaching the fourth line right winger how to take a puck off the wall or, you know, how to make these plays. And generally it's a dog eat dog world, right? At the NHL level, like no one's teaching you something like you got to figure that out. At least that's, that was my experience in that, in, 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 uh, in the game. But when you can get all those guys, 20 guys believing in something and that every, everyone's better together, you know, that's, that's when it gets special. Uh, totally, I agree. You know, and it's funny, I look back at my career and how lucky I was. Uh, I, when I came to New York first, Carol Vatney was a great player. We lost Carol, we lost, passed away a few years ago, but um, he was just finishing up his career. So, you know, he's another defenseman. And basically, I'm coming in as one of the guys to take his job. And, you know, instead of him being bitter about that, I mean, he, you know, obviously he wanted to continue to play, but he took me under his wing and it was just incredible the feeling he gave me uh, because here's this older guy who obviously believed in me. You know, that was the first thing. He obviously believed that I was good enough to play because he was taking time to to show me all this stuff. But uh, he was fantastic. In fact, we had a real bond. And I've told the story before, and it's kind of a funny story. But um, if we were, you know, he, so he became an assistant coach. And, like, I was you know, I was like his son out there. You know, guys used to joke around and everything. We played one of those games. It was in Winnipeg. And, like, every time you step on the ice, they score. I think this goes like 10 to 1 in the second period. It was an awful night. And, you know, Vads, like, he was a great, like, really attentive coach. He's trying to, you know, here's some mistakes. It's an opportunity to learn. So he's trying to talk to the guys. And he's got the French accent and everything. <clears throat> I'd gone on the ice and they scored. And he didn't see the goal that scored against us because he was trying to help somebody else. It was just, like, goal after goal. So uh, I come back to the bench and he goes, the puck, what happened with that goal? And I go, the puck went in the effing net. And I wasn't mad at him. I, mean, I, I came out as so disrespectful. I mean, Ron Gresham and I talk about it now. He's sitting right beside me. And he was like, oh, my God, Tom, what'd you just do? And um, I was like, oh. as soon as it came out of my mouth, I realized, like, you know, I'm, I'm devastated. This guy, he's done so much for me. He's been so great. And here I am being so disrespectful to him. It wasn't meant that way, but that's the way it came out. I went to him after the game to apologize, and he was in tears. I'd, I'd hurt him so bad, you know. And uh, it was it was an awful story in one way at the moment, it, but at the end it worked out to be good. And then I I expressed to him how much he'd done for me, how much he meant to me. Uh, but at the time, it was like Tom, you're an idiot. But it was, you know, it, but it, it it in a weird way after the dust had settled, it was this is what you're talking. It made me feel like, well, this person believes in me so much that you know I hurt his feelings by the way I, I conducted myself. So. Those kind of things, like you said, happen that, uh, you, you know, it's, it's so important to have that team atmosphere where you know, we're all helping each other get better, right? And I think that's the difference between – and I think it goes, you know, this it goes not just for sports, but it goes for families with parents and kids, and it goes for businesses, the same kind of thing. Yeah, and it's, it, it, I think it's counterintuitive to, to most of us, right? Like that yeah. helping somebody – yeah. focusing on that is going to now somehow help me right yes. which at the end of the day we're kind of worried about i and it and it's so true and that's why i don't know some guys get it i think naturally like anything else have an aptitude for it and some guys don't and i think the some guys that don't I, it's definitely something that can be learned and understood but it needs to be talked about right yeah. and it needs to be uh, again and again and again yeah. right i just think it makes you so much stronger i i think to me the real strong person pull people up with him right he doesn't push other people down i i get i can see like you said you can see why it happens but man i think you get more from helping somebody else than you that you feel better about yourself right and now they're looking at you like you're this, this great human being because you don't have to be doing that you're helping them do something that you don't have to help them yeah 100 percent. i think your baseline changes too i think even like I think your body chemistry changes, honestly, you know, when you're in that scenario. When I was talking with Dusty there the other day, I mean, I think an interesting aspect of that is like the goalie tandem scenario in, in pro sports um, saying like he believes in the team team unity aspect of that goalie combo. 
And yeah. what an interesting spot that is, because that's so easy for the other yeah. guy to think, like, how is this benefiting me if Hank Lundquist is unbelievable and plays yeah. and I'm supporting that, you know, and I can't get in the net. But it actually, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it does help. But I mean, it's not it doesn't seem seem natural at the time sometimes. Yeah, I know. I think it's a lot of it, too, is like how everybody's looking at you, too. Right. I mean, now they're looking at this guy like, well, he's a, like they. I think they have a confidence in you because they. I view it as if somebody's doing that, they're a strong person, right? That they would do that. You yeah. know, they, again, you know, they should be doing the opposite, right? They should be trying to do that. I've heard other goalies talk at the NHL level too, where they even try to throw the, you know, the, their own goaltender will be going into a game and they're trying to do something to aggravate him in the locker room. Right. I understand that? I'm going like, it just doesn't make any sense. That, I look at that as like an insecurity, right? You're not as strong as you know yeah. yourself uh, that you do that kind of stuff. But uh, so. Um, so you're coaching your own kids team and you go out and you coach other kids as well. Yeah. I got three of my own boys that are on three different teams. I'm head coaching the oldest one, um, which like you said, you know, I mean, that's, that's an unpaid position here in Vernon and it's uh, you know, it's a pretty big job to do it uh, at that level. And then, yeah. And then I got clients um, from around North America and uh, yeah, just helping, helping kids align with their dreams and get where they want to get to. And I say kids, I mean, kids meaning younger than me. Right. But, uh, in, in the amateur aspect and, uh, and, and looking towards working with either, you know, a junior team full time or, or somebody, you know, I got enough context in the NHL too. I think that this, this scenario, like the, that, that bridge between the sports psychologist and the coach, you know, like that, that person that's been there, the person that's approachable, it's not like you have to have a problem, you know, to, to talk to, to talk to somebody like me, but it's like just somebody to talk to period, you know, someone that's unbiased that has your best interest at heart period. Uh, and someone that has maybe some tools and resources to help you get to the next level out of yourself. And where can people find you? That's a good question. I'm on, uh, I'm on Instagram at Jason Padolan. Uh, my website's up my hockey.com. I got a parent group that's private where I help parents of young athletes, you know, help, help mentor their own kids, you know, in an area that maybe they're unfamiliar with. And that's it up. That's also up my hockey. So it's up my hockey's easiest way or my name, Jason Padolan. Good deal. Good. Well, great to talk to you again. It's funny, right? They look back at the history where you had going way back to your kid there sitting on the hotel room floor and then uh, dealing with each other too. And uh, when you're doing your and all that stuff. So it's great to see you're doing so well. How's your father doing? Oh, he's doing good. Yeah. He's still running the hotels and doing, doing his thing. And, and he's, he's busy and, you know, we're busy. We live in the same town and never see each other. It's crazy. Yeah. Right. It's just, yeah. the, it's just the way it goes. Oh, you know what? I just thought though, the Up My Hockey podcast, which hopefully you're going to be a yeah. guest on here one of these yeah. days. So yeah, I just started that this year, got eight, eight episodes and it's all talking with ex pro guys or guys that are in, you know, agents now or, or s somehow facilitating guys being great or have their own story. And it's kind of uh yeah, it's a podcast about about the process, essentially. You know, right. about so the journey. About your, your website is up my hockey. The podcast is up my hockey. Yeah, up my hockey podcast. You can find anywhere. That would be uh, that's what I'm focusing on right now. It's just fun. The interviews are great. It provides a lot of value for people. Um, you know, and it's uh, it's something that I enjoy. So yeah, if, uh, if people want to listen to that and download that, I'm really proud of the episodes, and uh, they got some good stuff on there. Excellent. Well, great to talk to you. All right, guys, that's great. Uh, Jason Padolan. He's been around the world playing hockey. Now he's helping other kids. So upmyhockey.com. Thanks, Jason. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me.